Hi, hello, welcome to Devon Monk's Works and Worlds. We are on Monday Monk 34. See, I can count. <laughs> and uh, thank you for being with me here. I really appreciate you stopping by. I'm going to cover the three things that I cover every week, which is how's writing going, how's knitting going, and how's other things in Monk World going. So writing is going very well, thank you. I joined a 100-day challenge last week. I think I think it started on Thursday. It started 10 days ago, 11 days ago. So anyways, I've been doing this 100-day challenge for about 11 days now. And so far, so far, I haven't missed a day. And the challenge is pretty easy. They set a, a relatively low bar, which is 250 words each day or a half an hour of sitting down with your manuscript and being in writing brain, not like outlining or that kind of thing. Um, so it's been working pretty well for me. I'm getting, most often I'm getting over the 250 word goal. My own little secret goal is to hit much more words than that each day that I sit down. But if I have one of those wild days that just, I can't get everything to lock into place so that I can get any sort of a chunk of time to write, 250 words will happen and that's at least a little more progress forward. So I'm really enjoying that. But I linked to it last week and I'll link to it again this week. 100 word writing challenge, I mean 100 day writing challenge is down below. So check that out. Writing is going well. I'm working on Wayward Sky and that challenge is helping me get to it a little faster than I normally, well, a little faster than I had been writing. So that's uh, very good. Um, where am I in the book? I'm at the part where I feel like I have a lot of things to fit in the book and I'm running already through a lot of words. So I'm trying to decide if I need to just, you know, giddy up and just get to the conflict parts of the book that I want to get to that I know are going to be super exciting. What I've done is exciting too, but I'm sometimes I'll kind of be like, ooh, this is, this is so exciting. I'm going to stay here and write on this for a while. And that's great, but sometimes you need to just kind of, you know, get a move on and get to the next part. So um, we'll see. I'm <laughs> I'm trying to balance the book's length for the conflicts and it's uh, this is book three in a series of six. So in some ways it's going to work as a pivot book. So anyway, so it's going well. I'm, I'm, I'm noodling my way through but definitely getting words. So writing good. Um, what else? Knitting. I don't have a new toy to show you today. I forgot to bring up <laughs> the toy that I'm going to give away, away in my newsletter on the 20 or on the 30th of September. So Friday, my newsletter will go out and I will give away, tell you what, I'll try to do a little magic here and uh, post a picture of the toy, but I'm giving away, let's see, I'm giving away this toy. Did it work? Did a picture show up? Uh, which is a little groundhog named Chet. That's the design's name, uh, Chet the Groundhog. And it's really cute. His hat comes off, his little overalls come off, and he is going to be given away to a subscriber of my newsletter that I just pull randomly out of the hat. And then uh, that winner will need to respond to me by email. I also send out a separate email to tell them that uh, they have won. So check your inboxes for my newsletter or email from me uh, on the 20, no, on the 30th, if you have uh, subscribed to my newsletter that little groundhog is going out to someone. So that's my latest knit toy. As for other knitting, I was, I think I'm going to do it. I've been waffling on it. I saw a friend of mine sent a link on Twitter for knitting for Ukraine and Ukraine refugees. And my only concern is if I actually knit something, will it go to someone who needs it? Like, will it go to the Ukraine refugees or will it just get you know, is it a strong enough system that can carry knitted things from people to Ukrainians who need it? Or is it something that'll get bottlenecked somewhere and just get tossed in a garbage or something? And um, I would really like it to get to somebody who needs it. Um, so I think I will go ahead and do some knitting for that and just make sure that I double check the charities that are gathering um, any kind of clothing supplies for Ukrainians. I don't want to just become part of the problem of too many things that someone doesn't need that, you know, maybe Ukrainian refugees don't need, um, just piling up in a big heap somewhere. Um, there's uh, years ago on the internet and I don't know, I can't remember exactly if it happened with chickens or if it happened with penguins, but someone had a bird of some sort, a flock of birds. I don't know 
like I said, penguins or chickens that had lost their feathers. And so they were requesting that knitters please knit little, there's a pattern for them. You can find them on the internet now, of knit little sweaters for the chickens or penguins, whichever it was. And people did. Knitters love to knit for a cause. And so they knit the cutest little sweaters for penguins or chickens, can't remember which. And then um, if I remember the story right, the sweaters just coming in. And they kept coming in and kept coming in. And even when the birds didn't need the sweaters anymore, more sweaters kept coming in because the story of of the needy birds kept going around the internet and people with knitters would find it and be like, oh, I can knit a little sweater and send it in, you know. And so I don't want the, the uh, knit goods for Ukraine to be that kind of a situation where someone said, hey, we could really use some hats for the winter. And then like, <laughs> you know, 300 million hats showed up that aren't useful. So I'm going to double check my charity uh, connections where it's actually going to. But if it can actually get to somebody who needs it, I will absolutely send it to them. And um, if not, I find it, might find another place to donate um, my next knitting to. And that is some hats. I thought I'd do some hats. Uh, this one charity is specifically asking for merino wool hats for the Ukraine because if any of you have ever worn merino wool, it's lovely, it's soft, and it uh, keeps you warm even if you're wet, and that's really good. That's one of the great things about wool, is even if you're wet, you're still gonna be warm. Uh, and it's good in the wind, too. So it's a very good winter wool. And um, so yeah, we'll see. I might be knitting a hat for that cause, but again, check it in so I'm not doing the chicken sweater thing. And uh, yeah, so that'll be my next knit thing. And then I do have a toy that I owe my son that I wanted to make for him and one I want to make for myself. And then of course, another one for October's newsletter. So that's all coming up. Okay, knitting's out of the way. Last thing we usually talk about is just Monk World. How's it going? It's going well, thank you. Um, our garden is giving us lots and lots and lots of tomatoes. Good tomato year this year, although we planted late. Uh, we planted from a start. We didn't plant the seeds. We got a start at the nursery. But we're getting good tomatoes and we'll probably have to turn those into sauce pretty soon. Our Italian plum tree is going gangbusters. We've got tons of Italian plums. Delicious. Um, what else? Oh, our Concord grapes. We have Concord grapes and they are, it's a, <laughs> it is a grapevine that is as old as the house that we live in. It was originally in the yard when the house was built and it has thrived ever since. You, you can't kill it. <laughs> It got so bad, it was once planted in the backyard. For It was originally planted in the backyard. It it was so, it's Concord grape people, and they do really good in the Willamette Valley because this Concord grape climbed up the fences, climbed up the trellis that it was supposed to be on, then on the fences, then on the bushes, and then it sort of elbowed its way up and reached up and grabbed our walnut tree limbs. Well, no, first it was our um, dogwood tree limbs and climbed up the dogwood tree and just leaped for the walnut tree and grabbed a hold of the walnut tree and then started eating the walnut tree, this grapevine. It was like, it was going up <laughs> 30 feet. It was this huge grapevine. Anyway, so we, we tamed it. We brought it back down and we dug it up and we weren't sure quite how it would handle the shock of being moved after being in the same place for 50 or 60 or 70 years or whatever but we moved it to a better place where it couldn't reach any trees. We basically stood around going, where in the yard can we put it where it won't eat any of the trees? Found a spot and stuck it in there. And it seems to have just been like, yeah, like you think that would bother me and it's doing fine as making grapes and we're very happy about it. So uh, Concord grapes are doing well this year and we're enjoying them. And then, uh, then our garden, because this year we planted it so late, we're not gonna get a lot more out of it. We do have carrots that we'll wait for uh, I don't know, October, November, maybe December even, and we'll get some nice fresh carrots. And I like getting a fresh vegetable in the middle of the winter months, so that's always fun. We've been through the equinox, happy equinox. I hope you are um, enjoying this cooling off if you're going into fall or if you're in the Southern hemisphere, you know, warming up if you're going into spring. And um, we, what else have we done around here? We've watched a few shows that we've enjoyed. Um, we like to watch a lot of different things, but here's some that I will specifically shout out. And I, I almost want to say that I have shouted this one out before. The Man Who Fell to Earth is a terrific show. The acting is just amazing. Um, the writing is really great. The How it's directed, how the um, photography, the music, uh, the storyline, it's just terrific. And 
I think I did mention this before because I talked about that I had read the uh, original book and this isn't the original book, but it definitely honors it. And uh, so uh, Man Who Fell to Earth, we've really enjoyed that. Um, the Great British Baking Show is back on. <laughs> and that, it feels like such a guilty pleasure. It's such a nice show. Everybody's so calm and the colors are pretty and the baked goods, some of them are gorgeous and the ones that aren't gorgeous are still way better than I could ever do. And um, it's a relaxing sort of show to watch. So uh, my husband and I, I got him into it. I'm like, it's kind of a competition, but it's very low key. But th some of the dishes that they make, some of the pastries and things that they make, I've, I've never tasted and I've never seen before. And it's fun to see different flavor combinations. And so it's back on. We are totally watching it and enjoying it this year. And then um, what else were we? Oh, and we have watched, and I highly recommend this just because it is an absolute howl, is uh, Welcome to Wrexham. And this is a real documentary about um, two actors. It's uh, Rob McElhinney. I think I'm saying his name right. He plays Mac on Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He uh, saw this Welsh football, which soccer for American folks, but Welsh, Welsh football team that he wanted to buy to to support the community and to raise his football team up out of the fifth level, like it's in the bottom level <laughs> of football teams over there. And um, so Rob McElhinney and, and Ryan Reynolds, who plays Deadpool, you all know Ryan Reynolds, but just, just to say it, um, they decided together to buy this football team. And neither of them have ever owned a sports team before. And um, one thing that's neat is that the actual arena where they play football in is the oldest international arena where a sport is still being played or where football is still being played. And um, it's called the race course because it used to be a race course for horses way, 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 way back. But now, you know, it's for football. And uh, the documentary is about the town in Wales and the people who this sports team is kind of the center of their community pride. And um, some of the vendors or the restaurant people who uh, support it and then just the fans who support it and the volunteers who support it. And it's a little bit about the players and it's about the stadium, what it has needed after years of not having enough uh, money support to keep it up. At, to the tip top shape. And it's about these two guys, Ryan Reynolds and um, Rob, right? Rob Mac, uh, McElhenney. I never say his name right, but them learning how to be owners of a football team and how do you um, provide the best for everybody, right? They go into it and they seem really genuinely hearted about it. And so anyways, if you aren't watching, welcome to Wrexham. I'll put a link to it below. Please give that a shot. Um, totally worth watching. Um, okay, and the last thing that I'll mention that we've been having some fun watching is a show on YouTube actually called Tasting History with Max Miller. And Max Miller used to be uh, a Disney performer. He worked on the cruise ships and I guess several other stage uh, Disney things. And during the pandemic, he decided to, he, could, he couldn't do performing, you know, the cruise, cruise ships were shut down and stuff. And so kind of, I guess on a whim, he always loved history and he always loved cooking, but he wasn't a historian and he wasn't a cook. He never wasn't a chef or a cook, uh, but he decided he wanted to research uh, food in history. Where did this dish come from? Where was the first time they made whatever, you know, devil's food cake? Where was the first time they ever made, you know, whatever, like, you know, burritos? And so he thought, well, I'll just do some research and, and he puts up he makes it fun and funny. He's got great uh, on-screen presence and uh, he puts up really interesting facts about where the recipes came from and then as closely as he can using the old recipes he'll reach out to universities to help him um, interpret the language and the recipes and stuff though he seems to know how to understand a lot of different you know English variations um, through the centuries right he does really good um, knowing like this, this amount means this back then. And, you know, like a quarter cup isn't the same at one time in history as another time, those kinds of things. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a historian, but 
he makes those recipes. So he makes the really old or the original recipes of whatever foods like uh, breads and uh, soups and uh, meat dishes through different cultures. He doesn't just stick with like, you know, he's not Eurocentric. He does a lot of different cultures and it's delightful. So if you get a chance, try Tasting History with Max Miller. I'll put a link to him below. Oh, I think he has a cookbook out too, which that might be fun to look at. We have tried one of his recipes and we really enjoyed it. And, um, or I've, I've tasted two of his recipes and um, enjoyed both of them. And I am totally up for making more of these recipes. And they are, they are old recipes. They're some of the original recipes, which make it really fun because you feel like you're getting the first version of whatever dish we've changed throughout the years, right? So yeah, uh, that's another fun thing to that we've been watching lately. And we're not always watching food shows. It's just those are the ones that are on right now that we that we're enjoying. Okay, so let's see. Uh, anything else going on in the monk world? Ooh, 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 I should say this. I'm getting new glasses. Very excited. And and this exciting part. For the first time ever, I'm getting a pair of prescription sunglasses. I have spent years driving with no sunglasses on, just <laughs> just staring into the sun, which probably explains some things about me. Um, but now I'm going to get some sunglasses. I'm really excited to try them because I, I don't know if you can tell from the camera, but I have pretty light blue eyes, not pretty as in beautiful, but like fairly like as in adequately blue, they're relatively light. And um, they say people with lighter colored eyes um, are more sensitive to sunlight in their eyes. I don't know. Maybe I've just always been used to it. I don't know not to be sensitive to them, but, or to be sensitive to it because the sun doesn't bother me too much, but I do squint, you know, and so it'd be nice to wear sunglasses and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it'll do a little less eye fatigue on my eyes. So anyways, I'm excited about glasses. Maybe I'll show them off when I get them. I should get them pretty soon. So that's it. That's about all that's going on in Monk World. We are getting ready for autumn. We are officially in autumn. It's feeling like autumn out there. The wind is carrying that little bite, that little bit of cold. You'll stand out there and you'll have this, like out in the yard, I'll stand out in the yard and have the sun on my back and it's like, oh, it feels really good. It's nice and warm. And then you'll get the wind in your face and it's got that cool breeze and you're like, ah, it's autumn. Like this is just before it tips over into, it's super cold and soggy. <laughs> I like this, this warmy, coolie with the leaves are just starting to turn and then it's just like rain, 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 rain. <laughs> But I love the rain, so I, I'm not complaining. And then I'm just like, oh, rain, now I get to be inside with my hot cocoa. <laughs> so I can find a little delight in each change of the weather. So I am enjoying the shift over into fall, and I hope you are too, or it shift over into spring if, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's it. I have talked for long enough, and I want to thank you for coming here on Monday. Um, I hope that you will show up again some other time when you just want to hear the chit chat what's going on around Monk House. And in the meantime, have a wonderful week and I'll see you soon. Bye.